Cool, sorry for the delay. Panel, the issue in post-colonial states is a vastly unequal distribution of property where the majority of land and economic resources is held by a small elite. An example of this is in Egypt, where 6% of the population owned 65% of the overall land in the 1950s. This came to be during colonialism, where land was stolen from the indigenous population and given to white colonists or local elites that supported them. These theft, the theft and centuries of exploitation deserve redress. Getting your land back is getting your country back. How do we do this? We implement a model similar to Egypt's immensely successful one in the 1950s. What land do we redistribute? We want to have a cap on how much land individuals can own. If people own more, we expropriate them. And if land, that land that is owned by the former colonial government will also be redistributed. Where does this land then go? We want to have this proportional according to ethnicity to restore the original balance. I, if your group makes up 10% the population, you will get 10% of the land. Additionally, poor farmers can apply for land and agricultural support, for example, fertilizers and seeds. This will be done well because there's an immense desire for land redistribution from the population. What else will we then do? We want to have other redistributive policies such as the social aid system, cash transfer programs, and heavy taxation for beneficiaries from colonialism. We lobby for reparations from former colonial powers. Precedents to this include the UK paying 50 million pounds to Kenya as a redress for the Mau Mau massacre or supporting agricultural programs in the 1980s. What then does the short term on both sides look like? We're willing to bite the bullet where we're most likely ending up with authoritarian governments in the short term on our side of the house. However, the rule of law still is possible. Look at Egypt or Namibia where we have independent courts and this is likely because countries are easier to rule if there's an order in some institutions and force their power. On opposition, what you're likely to get is an incredibly unequal society where most people are too poor to access their political rights. With that, two arguments in the speech. Firstly, on equality of life. Panel, the problem for the large majority of people in post-colonial states is that they lack a baseline of survival. They can't put bread on the table for your family. That is because they're exploited in large farms and work under slave-like conditions with very little pay. Opposition is unlikely to change this meaningfully for two reasons. One, because large landowners are likely to lobby the government to prevent any kind of legislation that would end exploitative labor. They can uniquely do this because of their economic importance. We expropriate them at their weakest right after independence. Second, because there are fluctuations in how much you can actually buy with your wage. That is, your money can decrease in its value, especially in a semi-stable economic system, whereas land you can always use. This means land is always better as a form of redress. How do we and help people. You can grow crops on the land that you receive. You're likely to do this very well for three reasons. One, because of the agricultural program, you receive seeds and fertilizers. Second, because you already worked as a farmer prior to you receiving that land. Most people were in agriculture. And thirdly, because it's generally not that hard, I can pro grow crops in my own garden. There's no reasons why African farmers wouldn't be able to do this. We then tell you that you're, they're likely to use the land even better than large farms because one, you're likely to work harder when you reap the benefits of your own work. Work. And second, because there's more sustainable agriculture because you depend on that land more than the large landowner does. But panel, even if baseline survival would be insured on either side of the house, owning land gives you collateral. That is, you can take out loans and use them to invest in economic opportunities like starting your own business, sending your children to school. This gives you the option of meaningful economic participation and a higher quality of life. Why is this so important, panel? Because we give enslaved people redress from centuries of exploitation where they can now meaningfully decide for themselves how they want to participate in economic activity. Second, because to access political rights, you need a good economic situation. I need spare time, spare capacity, and spare resources to make use of that, right? What doesn't matter if I have a right to education, but my children need to work to get food on the table and I don't have the money to pay for tuition and buy them books and paper. I can't organize a protest if I need to work to feed my family panel where we want um, economic baseline survival. But even if you don't, uh, but, but onto the second argument on stability then. Three layers to this. Firstly, we satisfy quality demands. Panel, people have a massive desire for material, for material equality because they feel and see this every day. There's a generational heart of your land being taken away. It's often also symbolic to have a government take land away from your exploiter that killed your family. And often the independence campaigns promised redistribution and largely ran on this. This means you need to meet this re need for redistribution. Otherwise, you end up with an unstable system because populists and radical forces can use the discontent and rile up people against the 
government, you generally get uprisings and strikes against the situation. This is incredibly bad in an already weak system. Second layer then on why our governance is likely better and more stable, because our authoritarian leader has massive incentives to improve people's lives tangibly. Panel, people are okay with having less political rights only when their lives are actually becoming better because of that. Look at China, for example. Second, because often these people are former revolutionary leaders. They care about the country and the state they're in a lot. They're really invested, right? They literally risk their life for independence. But then thirdly, they're also quite educated and knowledgeable about this country and its issue. And fourthly, I think generally we can know that they are good leaders because they reconciled independence movement. Compare the central opposition, where you get an unstable democracy because they have little buy-in. That is firstly because there's distrust into the Western democratic system. Panel, I just want to make this very clear. This was the system that was used to create the inequality you are experiencing. The system that was in place when your cousins were taken away, your parents were murdered by the white settlers. White missionaries put the system onto you. I don't think there's a reason why African farmers would trust it then. Second, because the ethnic groups have less of an incentive to buy into the system. That is because every group gains from overthrowing the new weak order. We are likely getting coups and constant changes in who leads what. Panel, there are precedents to this in Algeria in 1999 when an Islamist party tried to overthrow the government, or in Ghana when a military coup overthrew Kwame Nukwa's government. This is uniquely harmful to democracies because they depend on wanting people to buy into it. You need to go to elections, you need to accept their results, you need to support protests of either side of the house. Third layer then on why we get more action actionability. Democracies are generally slow, especially if they're new, right? You have no established compromise mechanisms. You don't even know which parties are running for an election then. Second, because democracies in post-colonial states specifically are likely blocked by ethnic tensions. We need to compromise and there are potential deadlocks that occur when parties specifically cater to certain ethnicities and are engaged in clientelism where policies are specifically designed only for one. Before I move on, why this argument is generally important is there a PY? Okay, moving on. Why then is stability so important? Because we think in the best case for opposition, you're getting an unstable and dysfunctional government that cannot deliver basic necessities like building hospitals and infrastructure because it all requirements requires government action that is blocked on opposition side of that house and a democracy that is in deadlock. But I think in it, their worst case, you have weak structures that are prone to coups and civil wars. Panel. You need to get your land back to get your country back. We say you get material equality before you get immaterial rights. So proud to propose. Okay, thank you for speaker from proposition. Now let's welcome for speaker from opposition. Hello, am I audible? Okay, great. Just give me a second to set up the timer. Okay. I'll begin my speech shortly. Just one second. Okay. I'll begin my speech in three, two, one panel we think a lot of what proposition is perpetuating is contingent on two things firstly it is contingent on the willingness of these leaders to redistribute land in the model that they have given to us firstly we look at the model of zimbabwe when zimbabwe was another country that prioritized land reform land was not accessible to the average individual but was rather prioritized to be redistributed to party loyalists and those who participated within the struggle and we think this was something that was common amongst most african states when we look at countries like Uganda and Zimbabwe. Why does this become important in proving that side propositions model doesn't work in this debate? That's on the first instance, on the willingness of the political leaders to partake in this form of redistribution. But on a second level, we don't think there's people who will buy into the fact of there being a cap being put on the amount of land that is being given back to them. Because we think on the principle of reparations, you do not choose the amount you wish to give back, but you give back what is due. If I, as a fan, as my fa ancestral family owned 30% of the land, I expect to be reparated 30% of the land. We think in terms of 
put a cap on this. You're likely to run into a lot of conflict and friction with people who do not agree with this model. But secondly, on that of buy we think ethnic groups especially won't buy in when we look at minority groups have already been disenfranchised in receiving a lot of their land um, from majoritarian groups. And at a point that you put a cap, we think it becomes a scapegoat to, from majoritarian groups not to give back majority of the land that was stolen from them. Secondly, we think that that a lot of people would be too poor to access a lot of these rights. In my speech, I'll be recontextualizing you, recontextualizing what economic reparations actually look like and what um, political emancipation also looks like, and then giving you intuitive rebuttals in it as we go on. So firstly, on recontextualization, we think the contention in this debate relies on where we think the international community can assist these post-colonial African states in attaining the best method, which would then guarantee the second one as well. What does political emancipation look like and what does economic emancipation look like? Firstly, political. We think this looks like drafting legitimate constitutions. Secondly, providing a separation of powers between the judiciary and executive. And thirdly, setting up a judicial system that acts as checks and balances on justice in the current country on a civil and political level. We think economic emancipation looks like the devolving of financial means down to the leaders appointed of these countries to embark on economic revival on their own with no real guidance or setting up of a democ democratic structure. Why this is true? We think it is the common trend that is perpetuated in multiple countries if we're really looking at what economic preparations look like, not what side proposition gave you. We look at the, how the Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe government said they wanted land reparations in the Lancaster House Agreement of 1979, and they were given 650 million euros that equated to the amount of land that was stolen from their people, and then they were told to do with it as they please, whether or not they would use it to buy back their land from the white settlers. So we find, as of, we find it more preferable in pursuing a sound political system. The clearest, the clearest context of these two routes we will use in this debate is that of the context of South Africa and Zimbabwe. The reason why is because geographically they are close in proximity and share a lot of the same geographical things. So they were ruled by the same people and thus their only real substantive reason for difference in political, economic and social progression is their difference in the routes taken after gaining independence. We think one, South Africa asked for help in setting up administrative judicial structures and a demarcation between their executive and their judiciary, while Zimbabwe with prioritized economic emancipation in the form of the um, reparations. This will act as a rebuttal to a lot of the substantive from first speaker. The impact of this, firstly, South Africa in the 28 year democracy has been able to recall two of its presidents to question their conduct with Zuma effectively facing jail time and rep uh, repercussions. Whilst in Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe had a 37 year term in office because the constitution ultimately allowed it. This being Zimbabwe focused on economic emancipation and in turn this had a de de despot in its presidency presidency while South Africa has curbed this with political structures. And secondly, South Africa in turn has experienced a degree of economic emancipation after pursuing political emancipation. We think this looks like there's been better housing at cheaper pri prices, a new industry that has begun to spring up and a political system where its people can call it out and they're being changed at a point in time that people call out the inconsistencies within the political system. Whilst the Zimbabwean economy is shattered when we look at the 2000 land reform, reform, um, reform policies that came along that prioritized devolving land to loyalists and those who participated in the struggle, not actually reparating it back to the people who reparating it back to the people who previously owned it. Why is this a problem? This is a problem that is particularly contingent on side proposition at a point in time that they want to put cap, caps on the amount of land that they devolve back to people. This would mean that there's no guarantee that one, those who lost a certain you amount lie. of land will attain it back. And secondly, those who may not necessarily actually had any um, any claims on said land might gain claims to access on said land if they have a political and social quota in that country at that point in time. We think this looks like loyalists to certain um, dominant parties parties and those who then support this movement. This becomes important when we ask ourselves, how do we measure the success, the success of a post-colonial state? Four things. One, on the existence of an effective system of hierarchy. Secondly, the average utility to the basic citizen. Thirdly, the self-sufficiency of that state. And fourthly, international relations and its position in geopolitics. Menzi will touch on three and four, and I will touch on one and two. But before that, I'll take your POI.
How would a farmer in Zimbabwe ever have survived if 5% owned 60%, 60% of land in Zimbabwe in 1980? We think it's much better that you expropriated. At a point in time that we think that you are pursuing a policy of economic reparations, it means what has been taken away is what you must give back. At a point in time, this is what your model leaves room for someone to then lay claims to a land that they previously did not know. We find that there's something extremely morally problematic on your side of the house. But even engaging on your best case scenario, we think that um, you better capacitate these people to gain access to these lands. At a point in time, you set up political systems where they can lay claims to it. On your side of the house, they cannot lay claims to that land because they are not humanized, they do not have a political voice, and they do not have any grounds to approach a judiciary that will support them in laying claims to that land. Now, on that, how we create a better hierarchy and a better utility. Firstly, we think when you set up proper political systems, you have better checks and balance, balances on political leaders. That is why a South African citizen can sue state and actually get this win, holding state an account of its action. We offer that in contrast to Zimbabwe, where in 2019 January riots, how none of the police force who opened fire on the citizens were held accountable to the state. This is why Museveni can be empowered for extended periods of time with constitution offering no ammo to opposition parties to actually remove him from power. This is lack of efficient political structures have been set up to ensure that haven't been set up to ensure equitable equitable access on our on their side of the house you have a better clear defined structures with clear roles on our side of the house where there is no confusion on what the judiciary is responsible for what the executive is responsible for and therefore this allows people to then exercise the monopoly and self-determination to lay claims to things that were previously theirs but on what means is going to further extend on the speech and just a bit of preemptive on that on the principle of self-determination and how we attain better utility. We think in the inverse on their side, issues of economic emancipation come up due to there being a messianic complex of the liberators who then will not want to equally distribute land amongst those who truly own it and those who previously owned it, but amongst their loyalists and those who they wish to devolve it to. Side with opposition because that is siding with humanity. Okay, thank you. The first speaker from the proposition. Now let's welcome the second speaker from the proposition. Okay, just give me a second to set up everything, find all my notes. Okay, uh, I would more prefer if you from my POIs either wave your hand in the camera or, or type them in the chat. So please don't give them to me audibly if that's okay. Okay, perfect. I'll start this debate in three, two, one, three things I'm going to talk about, implementation, quality of life, and how does political systems look like in practice. Before that, I want to note one thing. The material always comes before the immaterial. I care more about having to put food on the table, sending your kids to school, or starting your own business, than I care about casting a vote that doesn't change an election, or having the ability to sue the government, even though I can't afford the lawyer. You only ever get your country back when you get your land back. This is what proposition stands for. Firstly, on implementation. I think here, opposition tries to push us unjust burdens on us. They argue our claim doesn't really work, and are therefore, we not actually achieve the change we get. But add, someone on the other side argue they get a perfect one. I don't think this is fair. Firstly, I think we can reasonably assume that a cap will be high enough to get enough land. I think an authoritarian leader has an incentive to set the cap at a certain level where his policy is effective enough to actually achieve the change he wants. Why would he otherwise try it in the first place? Secondly, I also think we get a justice system just as they do. The difference then lies in how the democracy and political system looks. The reason is because even as an authoritarian leader, I need to have an incentive and a way to enforce the policies, enforce the rule of law I want. A government and a way where I can sue people is a great way on how 
I can do that. Okay, two direct responses, uh, two direct attacks they give us. Firstly, leaders would not be willing to actually redistribute. I think that's a fairly wrong claim because I think we've told you here enough. I think one, there's a huge reason from the people to want this inequality and want this land redistribution. They would hate it, the fact that the colonizers came in here, yeah, stole the land and took it away from them. They want this back. I think land, secondly, is more tangible than political rights. This is something that gives them an immediate benefit. I don't think they can claim on their side. There's a bigger idea of getting theirs. Thirdly, I would argue because equity and uh, equity is uh, affects how happy you are because I compare my happiness and high life satisfaction compared to other people. If everyone is equal on our side and people want to feel happy, we're more likely to get that. I think landowner and politicians, even regardless, have incentives to also push that. On the one hand, they want brownie points, right? They want to make sure there's no uprisings that actually control them down. They want to have a symbolic policy that people can actually get behind, something that applies to all ethnic groups, not just clientelism. And secondly, because I think there's a big threat in them if they have landowners that are too powerful. If you have a couple of elites that are powerful, there's in the people you have to serve to, people you have to to give like tax breaks and other things to people who control you out of policy. I don't think it's something you would want. I think therefore on our side. Secondly, the idea is they tell us, oh, the cap system is wrong because not everyone gets a just representation. I think this happens on a spectrum. Thus, even if I don't perfectly get what I want or what I deserve, even if it's getting some is better than getting none, I think therefore this principle still stands. But note, they assume our policy does not work at all, but don't ever prove why implementation on their side works. I would argue implementation is harder for something that is intangible or something that is not native to this community and it's harder to actually implement. Secondly, on the quality of life of these people, because I think you, Ahana, tells you quite a few mechanisms here which go completely unresponded to. The only ideas we get, no thank you, is this idea it's not perfectly redistributed, but I think even on a marginal level, even I tell you, because they want to cater to every ethnic group, they want to make sure this is a policy that they can reunite people under, they're more likely to make this fair. But even if they don't, even if they give it to some people, I still think this works for a majority of people, right? I still think a majority of people now can flee exploitation of these landowners, can flee the loan wages and therefore actually get possibility of some economic operation. Some is better than none. But I want to crucially give you an extension of what, uh, what Joanna here tells you. Because I tell you, rich landowners, oftentimes embedded in the colonial structures, use their land to sell back to the West. A person in the Ivory Coast, a farmer, probably sells his cocoa beans in his farm back to the West. Comparatively on our side, local producers are more likely to produce for themselves. This crucially means we get more food on the table for people in this area. This is better. I want to tell you, because this argument is not enough responded by, this works really well and is super important. I tell we tell you that we get people who are on the worst side of this better out because we give them uh, we give them a baseline of severity. But even if you're better off, we give them collateral. This is super important because I think we judge our happiness, individual happiness, compared to other people. This is better on our side and we feed people's mouths. Secondly, I be a totally on the idea of political systems. I just want to point out here that South, uh, the ideas of picking out two examples and trying to win the whole debate on this is completely untrust. We are talking about hundreds we're talking about tons of different countries here. I don't think it's fair. But even if you use the metrics of South Africa being the perfect example, South Africa had the highest crime rates, like last year, you know, like in the whole world, at least in Africa. They had a huge unrest in 2021, and 350 people died in that. I don't think there's an example where they prove that this work policy works in other way. The only idea we get here is that we have a loyalist. I want to point out this again would mean that we've given uh, power to a small elite. This is not something a politician has an incentive in, because a small elite would mean I'm dependent on a small group to actually keep me in power. Do I have multiple people spread it out there's not an individual who can actually throw me out of my room spreading the eggs i have to feed to meaning for example giving economic growth to everyone giving land reform to everyone because it's something everyone can get behind is so much better again i want to point out here that johanna gives you mechanisms on how for example political deadlock will happen how for example policies will not actually enacted or there's several rights on their side i think is hugely important let's get to my own substantive addition here the long-term trajectory the thesis is in the best case scenario of both sides, proposition gets fair redistribution, opposition gets their political rights. We also get political rights on op uh, proposition. Why will opposition not get land redistribution in the long term? The reason is because opposition gives all their people political rights. This also means they give the right to property. This means opposition can't anymore expropriate the land of people because property rights are protected. It leaves them two options. One, they either have the pros policy of like of having a willing seller, possibly for problem one, that not everyone is willing to sell their land. But even if they are, because they know this is a government plan, they hold the leverage of keeping prices extremely high and therefore not actually being affordable for the government. Secondly, they can expropriate land without a willing seller because the land a government actively infringes on the right of a person. Compensation here has to be extremely high to justify this. 
problem is post-colonial countries, oftentimes are extremely poor, have small government budgets, they can't actually afford this. This is opposition's worst case. This means this won't have any form of land redistribution at all. In opposition's best case scenario, they get some land distribution, but it's on a small scale, doesn't affect everyone. Few privileged people get this. It takes a big part of government budget and is really slow and takes a lot of time. Before I can tell you where proposition gets political rights and redistribution, I'll take a POI. Filters and cash transfers can't be equitable without a justice system to safeguard these things. I think I tell you this in my intro, we also have a justice system, we also have a legal system, and the active incentive on why we have it is because it makes it easier to actually implement these policies, but uh, implement their policy, implement their rule. But even if you don't buy my mechanistic examples, look at Namibia, look at Egypt, look at different authoritarian countries like Saudi Arabia in the world, they still have these kind of justice systems. I don't think there's a claim, I don't think there's a mechanism behind how they get this. Okay, why do we get political rights and redistribution in long term? What we create is a strong middle class. Lots of people on our side own land suddenly, and now have a baseline of wealth. Additionally, they can use the land they have to pay for education, to start a business and actually grow. Analogy here is on their side, they have an Elon Musk. On our side, we'll have a million homeowners. This will lead to the democratization in the long term because people with economic power will now demand political rights. This is especially the case because these people are more educated on our side and they're rich enough to actually care about other things than just uh, care about other things and not just only their material well-being. But the middle class is so big and so vital for the economy that even the credible threat of them standing up, them stopping producing goods, is enough to bully and push the government and actually giving up. I think the authoritarian regimes at that point are unable to further be able to do this. How this could look is, for example, in a British monarchy, where, for example, you had the rich aristocracy, which you only cater to, but at the point of industrialization, you had merchants, you had engineers, you had a bigger middle class who were wealthy, and because of this, the king had to create assemblies and later parliament to satisfy the demands of this growingly important class. Democracy was created because a few couldn't could be paid off with government contracts but because we had so many people now you had to necessitate and you had to give them powers even if this fails governments will have to improve their institutions and to go kind of go in the demands of these people bettering the lives of everyday people because of all of this because we can claim their benefits they can't claim ours vote side property The second speaker from Team Proposition. Let us welcome the second speaker from Team Proposition. All right, um, my name is Menzi. I'll take your eyes in the chat. Um, that said, I'll start this speech in three, two, one. Chair, civil rights are the foundation of citizenship and creating national identity. And that is important for the building up of a new and a functional nation we are proud to oppose. A few things that I'm going to talk about in this speech. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the average citizen that proposition cares so much about in their quality of life. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about what exactly does it mean to enhance economic policies. And then I'm going to talk about argumentation, primarily on utility and a few extensions of the things that you already got in first but I think first, we have a couple of direct engagements to the lines that Proposition wants to run in this debate. Because Proposition does a few things that you lose in this debate on strategy alone. Firstly, they assume so much fiat power to assume that their policy is going to be implemented, to assume that their policy is going to work, and to assume that their policy is going to actually achieve equal redistribution of all the things that exist. There's a few reasons why they cannot get away with this in the debate. Because we don't necessarily think that prioritization of like economic and land reparations is something that hasn't been tried historically and is something that is entirely new. That is to say, first, on reparations, we think reparations is not to say we kept the amount of land that you get. It is to say we take land that was taken away by white colonizers and give it back to black people. When they tell you that their form of reparation is kept in land, we say, A, they are contextual to the actual chat of the debate. B, they also are untrue to principles of reparations within themselves. On that alone, they deserve to lose this debate. But then second, even if we take them in their best case scenario and it were true that capping accounted for reparations and was an actual model that they could use. We say, secondly, they needed to prove to you how colonialistic African states, post-colonialism, like at that very period, was sufficient enough and was stable enough to take up such a policy and to rightfully implement it. That is to say, they needed to show you the existing political structures that could actually hold into account leaders to make sure that they actually distributed land in the means that they feared it. Secondly, they needed to show you that there existed actual burdens for these political leaders and actual checking mechanisms that 
would make sure that they kept this lens in the systems that they feared. Because in first speech, Sharon explicitly tells you how in the prioritization of actually lens redistribution, what happened is in majority of countries that did prioritize this, we had situations where you only had people who were at the forefront of the liberation movement actually gaining access to lens because the rest of the country could not fight this because they had no civic liberties to look to and to fight back on anyway. Cool. A few things then that we think are very important to engage in this debate so that we understand what's actually happening. Firstly, just on basic contextual clarity and what these two policies look like, because proposition has no proper understanding after Sharon gives you an actual analogous thing of what happens in Africa. A few things that we think are very important. A, we told you that when you look at things such as political reparations and what they look like, such as like creating civic liberties, it means that the countries like Western liberal democracies at a point at which these countries were becoming post-colonial. There was a meeting that was set up. Each the Lancaster House Agreement and also like the movement within South Africa. What happened is it was you had to prioritize whether or not you had to create proper financial structures and redistribute land, or you had to create actual political systems where individuals could vote and you would build up large democratic sites which would be used as accountability mechanisms. The reason why the two examples that they have for their entire case don't work, Egypt and Namibia, is primarily because Namibia invested mostly in creation of proper functional democratic structures that could hold governments accountable and make sure that they couldn't merely just take advantage of citizens and points at which they wanted to. They are really contextually investigated. Before I talk about quality of life, I'll, I'll take that before I go. Why then did a majority of countries that tried civil political rights fail and try slide back into authoritarianism on your side? Listen, you are very up contextual to what actually happened in Africa. There's a few things that happened. We say, A, the countries that did prioritize the creation of political and civic rights, countries such as South Africa, managed to create systems that were efficient. That is to say, you managed to recall Jacob Zuma, managed to recall Tabo Mbegi, you managed to historically recall actual presidents. Two, it meant that these individuals have been capacitated to historically sue the state and effectively take out presidents. This didn't happen in countries that actually prioritized the creation of, you know, that prioritized debt reparations and stuff. Sharon already explained this to you in first speech. Let's talk about quality of life because this is propositions based level of engagement. We're saying one, this is contingent in them proving that they're actually able to enjoy economic emancipation without political rights. Why do we think that this is unlikely? We say firstly, there's a trickle down harm of, how, of what these leaders look like, especially post independence. We told you that these leaders in themselves viewed themselves as heroes. That is to say, they viewed themselves as those who deserved more than the basic and average citizen within society. They were more likely to actually capture the state and use it for themselves at a point at which citizens did not have active democratic structures to call them out and to make sure that the system was inherently better. No, the only reason why white people were effectively able to take away the land of black people is because they did not have civic rights that protected them from that ever happening in the first place. When you just take those people and give them back those that land in that very same situation, we think it is equally easy for the governments that exist to use policies to directly take away that land, even if they redistribute it at the very start of your policy in your best case scenario. So we think anyway, you're likely to, to repeat the harms that you talk about. So the best response that you get then from opposition to our uh, from proposition to our entire case is that like economic policies in themselves are unstable, we don't necessarily have structures and why the structures don't exist. I think in first speech Sharon does a really good job in showing you what certain democratic structures actually look like political in, 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 in post-colonial African states and systems where it was prioritized. But in itself is to say, it meant that you would sit down at the table with active people who are already involved, such as the UN and other bodies that are already actively involved in democratic systems. They would help with the initial foundation of say democratic systems and make sure that they were found and make sure that you could actually separate legislature and other forms of state power to make sure that they were sufficient in holding people accountable, et cetera, et cetera. So a few things then also in other extensive argumentation. Firstly, I think it is very important to understand what this means for self-sufficiency, because Sharon explains to you that self-sufficiency efficiency is very important for countries to be functional in the first place. Note that historically there's been a direct correlation between democratic countries and countries that are able to be self-sufficient. Note, countries such as Norway, Sweden, and Belgium, which are the most democratic countries in status quo, are largely the countries that are also the most self-sufficient. Why do we think that it is true? We say one, because you directly create a system where individuals are represented in parliaments and policies are directly passed to actively build up citizens and make systems better for them. But then secondly, we say you create active accountability mechanisms. These accountability mechanisms create systems in which you can actually directly have a system where you can call out governments at a point at which they don't necessarily like 
like, um, you know, solve the problems that exist within these countries. But fair and fine. I think this debate is about who achieves both sides of the spectrum the most or to the greatest degree, even when you prioritize one thing. Proposition cannot fear that they end up with political rights. No, Zimbabwe in status quo is still a very unstable democracy. You still have people who can actively be called out as autocratic. We say also countries such as Rwanda also haven't achieved actual political change within status quo. What's the delta here? We say when countries actually prioritize political, creating functional political systems, you do a few things. A, you create judicial systems that you can actively go to at a point at which you're not being economically emancipated as an individual and complain about that, you create structures that you can directly complain to. But two, if you have a historic claim to a certain piece of land, if you have functional judicial systems, we say those judicial systems can actively help you as a person with civic and political rights to reclaim that land as yours. The difference here is that on proposition side, they only assert that their policy actually works. We show you how political rights directly give individuals claim to a judicial system that makes it sufficient for people to end up getting their economic and their preparatory rights that they want to prioritize. We think we've been on both matrix and everything that they've done otherwise is symmetric, proud to oppose. Uh, just give me a second to get my timer, please. Um, I prefer my POIs audibly, uh, otherwise I might not see them in the chat. Panel, proposition can't get both. They tell you that Rwanda and Zimbabwe never got right. But note that Rwanda is now a functioning democracy. Why? Because of economic land distributions, they were able to get a functioning democracy that could then push for democratic rights. Note that Zimbabwe is probably one of the only examples that they could pick here to cherry pick, right? Just because it didn't work in one country doesn't mean that it wouldn't work in others. We point you to the example of Malawi. We point you to the example of Namibia. We point you to the example of Egypt. All of these were examples where first you introduced land risk distribution and then you were able to get a democracy. Also note that if the only countries that they want to talk about are South Africa, Africa and Zimbabwe, we will tell you two things. Firstly, on Zimbabwe, the situation would be much worse if on top of the autocracy, you would then also have economic inequality. At least most people in Zimbabwe are able to live in relative economic stability. But secondly, on South Africa, note that it literally has the highest crime rates in Africa. For example, note that 2021 violent protests, right? Like, yes, maybe the government styles and violently struck down a protest, but people struck each other down. I wouldn't want to live in that country. Okay, with that, I'll be talking about three things. Firstly, about implementation. Secondly, about the economic. And then lastly, about the political. So let's start off by talking about implementation, right? Because their opposition's push is that implementation will be bad because land will be given to rich people and loyalists. Two reasons. Firstly, note that elites are a direct threat to leaders, right? So if you give people economic power, they can then use this power to defeat you and control you politically, right? Especially right after a revolution where leaders are presumably the weakest, it is a bad idea for them to give lots of land to powerful people, right? It is much easier to tax and control lower classes in the short term. Secondly, note that after a revolution, there is still this revolutionary mood, right? The leader has seen what can happen when the people get angry and overthrow a government. This is why they are likely to want to get brownie points with the entire population. That means that giving land retribution, therefore like ending 
basically colonization because only if you get your land back do you get your country back. It is likely to be incredibly popular. Note that also this policy equally benefits all ethnicities. And thirdly, if you are relatively well off, then like the potential person, the potential personal gain from a revolution does not outweigh the risk of like having the revolution fail. For all of these reasons, it is a very good idea for these leaders to implement this policy to like keep their power, which is why they will do this. Note that this is unlike political rights, right? Because when you give people the ability to vote you out of office, this directly threatens your leadership, right? We would tell you that opposition simply asserts that they will be able to get a democracy. Never do they give you mechanisms, structural reasons why they will be able to do this. We would give you two further reasons why it is much easier to get land redistribution than a functioning democracy. Firstly, land redistribution is a one-time policy. A functioning democracy like needs continuous political buy-in and people to support it. Secondly, right, note that on our side of the house, we have a capable administration that previously distributed land to the colonizers and can now do the Verse and like a, like give it to the local population versus on their side of the house they have no tradition of a western democracy how is it going to stand but ultimately Tavon's argument tells you why on the long term we will be able to implement both right because only we can do this because when you have a democracy that functions if we take opposition at their best then that democracy guarantees property rights right and you would have to give people compensation for like and that would probably be too expensive for a developing country's government on proposition we tell you the more economic power people have the more they will push for these to be politically formalized if a lot of people can now care about self-actualization, that is when we get democracy in the long term on our side. Okay, with that, let's talk about the economic right. And under this, we tell you that the material must always come before the immaterial. Why? Three reasons. Firstly, because people simply care more about material things, right? In order to redress past injustice, I have to get my country back. I have to get my land back. This is internalized injustice that people want to redress. Secondly, on an individual individual metric, material things are simply more tangible for me and have a bigger impact on my quality of life. If I have money, I can pay a good education for my kids and give them a good life. However, one vote is unlikely to change the outcome of an election. Thirdly, material things are logically prior in Maslow's hierarchy of need, right? First, you need safety and your physiological needs met before you can reach self-actualization. I need money in order to pay tuition, in order to get access to my right to education. I need to be able to buy a newspaper in order for freedom of press to matter. This is why you should prioritize the economic. Now, why are people economically better off on our side of the house? Johanna talks to you about survivability, right? How now people are not forced into exploitative work on like elite farms anymore, right? that these elitists can lobby in weak democracies where there is less accountability and transparency to keep these people in like extremely bad working conditions. She talks to you about fluctuations of currency and also note that oftentimes on these big farms run by elites, crops get exported to the West instead of selling to local populations because that is more profitable. We tell you all of this massively harms the local population and Therefore, they are badly up. On our side, at least, they can have subsistence farming in which they will be very invested and is more likely to be sustainable. But we tell you that on top of this, people can get loans and have collateral in order to have an education, a business. This is unique to our side of the house. The only two responses we get is, oh, but people don't buy into a cab system. But note that comparatively, they are better off than under colonization, right? They will be happy to simply be better off to have some wealth, even if it isn't perfect, because presumably, I understand that perfection isn't perfect. But secondly, because colonization was probably like 200 years or so, they probably don't even remember who exactly the land owned for. Now, what they tell us is, oh, but on our side of the house, people can sue for the land. Firstly, we would tell you that oftentimes there is a lack of official land records from this period. So how would you ever prove that this land belonged to you? But secondly, we will tell you that the elites to whom this land belongs to have more money to pay for good lawyers, and they could possibly even corrupt the courts in a weak democracy. 
democracy, right? We believe that therefore your chance as a poor exploited person to ever get that land back is basically zero. Okay, with that, let's talk about political things, right? Because here we basically get two push. Firstly, that they will be able to like hold politicians accountable. But again, note that Mugabe is probably a massive exception because he's the most autocratic leader. In most other countries, these have eventually been toppled, right? And note that even if like they are right, they need to prove why their democracy will be able to work in the long term, right? We tell you that it is like um that it is much more likely that because like rights like that are on our side of the house, we get stability. And this matters because rights cannot be guaranteed in instability, right? Instability means that it is more likely that the country goes back into conflict, authoritarianism backslides, and your quality of life is massively like impacted when you don't have stability, right? At this point, it doesn't matter that the West will help because the West has no idea about your local country. Just look at Afghanistan. Ultimately, uh, Tavun even told you that on our side of the house, we're likely to get a better democracy because it's initiated by the locals. For all of these reasons, so proud to propose. Okay, thank you, the third speaker from Proposition. Now let's welcome the third speaker from Proposition. Am I audible? Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll take your eyes in the chat and I'll begin my speech in three, two, one. Panel, even if intuitively you buy into some of Proposition's arguments, I'm going to show you why strategically they lose on their model when it's never specific. And I'll also show you why they lose on all their principles because they're not absolute. We don't even think they understand what reparations are at this point. I'm going to show you why the democracies we're talking about didn't fail, at least not in the ways they think they did. We think even if countries have a high crime rate, that doesn't mean you can't take those people to court and actually we hold them accountable. That is the difference. That is what we're defending. But let me take you through specific things that were said. Firstly, they say in second prop, we're going to set up courts to regulate and safeguard these economic rights. Note that is something they cannot run. Courts are a judicial principle that is a part of our case, a part of prioritizing the safeguards that exist under a democracy. Civil and political rights are your only legitimate claim within a court of law. They can't actually safeguard through courts. Secondly, they tell you they're going to have a 10%, like you can't own 10, more than 10% of the land. First of all, we think this is actually like very big right you're still going to have a lot of white strongholds but then they also tell you that like they're going to have people having some of this land first they say that they're going to do enough to make people happy then they tell you in third that some is better than nothing so they're okay we don't think they're principally consistent here but even if they were principally consistent what do they not tell you about they don't tell you about any of the monopolized businesses that the, and what they're going to do with those they don't tell you how they're actually going to transition an economic stronghold that's going to that has been exploited to, towards people. They just tell you that you're going to give some black people marginally more land. And they said that this was going to sit like people are going to be satisfied with this, even though it was way less than they deserved, given what white people stole um, historically. We think they're the only ones who actually normalize a conflict and a civil war within their country. But <coughs> thirdly then, they tell us that Rwanda is a functional democracy. First of all, Paul Kagame is an autocratic regime. He is a dictator, effectively. Do they have some economic systems that work? Sure, we can agree, but people do not have civil rights within that country. That is never true. Secondly, Egypt is also kind of a contextual because they regulated their specific economic things by having courts first. We think this is also civic, so, um, civil and political rights. So let's get into some then specifics of the debate and res direct responses to those things. Firstly, we tell you that the problem with um, land redistribution and like in status quo, even in democracies, right, is that it's, it's controlled by the elite. There is an inequality within South Africa. That's something we can concede to, right? But why is their land still controlled by the, the elite? Note, we give you 
a full five-layer analysis on the nature of governments who are going to come into power, right? And even if they originally had altruistic incentives, why they have a Jesus complex by thinking they saved and actively liberated people in the struggle and think then they don't owe as much to the citizens as they should and are willing to manipulate the power they have, especially when there's no accountability mechanism to necessarily hold them accountable. We think at that point, we think they take a lot of the wealth for themselves, as we've seen in status quo, or just give it to their friends, loyalists. This is things that they never responded to within this debate, other than to say they made election promises or like promises during the liberation struggle that they actively are still going to uphold for some reason. They give you no examples. They give you no analysis as to why, especially when they actually fail on the promises they made, because what they actively said in the struggle is that you get all your land back, everything they deserve. Now they're giving you this cap that means you don't even get that. What are we then talking about in, um, further than that, right? They tell you that we're going to have little buy-in into our democracy because people distrust like colonial governments, right? Yes, everyone distrusts um, exploitative regimes, exploitative structures. Democracy is the like direct opposite of that. We think people largely buy in to what we're doing here. But why do they buy in even more? Because they get to self-determine. It means that they get to actively choose who they have in pow power and have a political voice to choose what kind of policies shape their lives, right? We think that even if you don't have a lot of money to send your child to school, the fact that you have a political voice to actively call out government for its lack of in, um, investment in the education system is still a mechanism for which you are able to protect yourself when you don't have like all that money, even though we don't think like everyone is dirt poor within a country, even if we run on their best case. But note then why people aren't even self-reliant when they can't even tell us who is going to be in this and their side of the debate or that it's the majority of the country but they can't even tell you that it's there's a likelihood that this happens but note that even in an economic sector right the, the harm that happened even within that space of society was not just the wealth stolen right that's just one aspect but when you go to your job there's a lack of protection in minds because you don't have a claim to that protection it means you're actively having your dignity violated violated every time police like strip search you for something and necessarily brutalize you in the streets. It's when you don't have a claim to have sick leave at your job, right? We think these are all problems that still run rampant in their society that actively means people are hurt every single day, do not have their dignity recognized on a president level within any system of society. And that is necessarily something you're always going to prioritize more when they tell you safety is something that's very important to you, but somehow make that analogous to economic rights and not the very rights that put people in jail when they necessarily harm your safety. Note the contradiction there and why they can't have it all. Note why we actually can have it all. Because we, when you set a precedence of dignity within society, we think when the ANC comes into power, Mandela directly states that there needs to be a truth and reconciliation commission that necessarily deals with how we reparate people, how we quantify injustice, because it wasn't just an economic harm, it was a dignity one. And we directly talk about those things. And we have BEE set up in the economic economic system, which is like a form of quota, right? We have things like affirmative action. We have things like grants and social welfare that trickled down. That is the status quo. We did have both. Even if it's not to the extent that side of position, proposition wants, we think it's still a better on that comparative. Quickly, if you are. Malawi's redistribution plan led to a 40% increase of income for the people involved. Why don't you want this for every single African? Because it's not equitable at the point in which it's not equal across the globe. You can't have a reparation principle and still give that 40% to the elite, right? We don't think that works. But when we say to you that that increase in and of itself was something that can still gradually happen over time when we sit, when we set a precedent that people and their dignity matters and it's going to matter in the economic sector as well when we start to reparate them slowly and like prop them up within the financial world. We think that that's a benefit we can, we're willing to to trade off and push to the side when we then look at like um, democratic and civil rights that necessarily mean you have people in place that protect you, that safeguard you, and that democracy can never backslide because
because there's a constitution and constant pressure, that means when people do then have those like power hungry incentives that we do, we recalled Jacob Zuma, we recalled um, Thabo Mbeki, and that necessarily could only happen on our side of the house because we realize that things like brutality, things like expo exploitation are not exclusive to white people. And that's something that the other side can never actively claim why they protect for those things. So proud to close. Okay, thank you, third speaker from opposition. Now let's welcome the third speaker from opposition. Um, right, so I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. Chair, it was very important to understand the harms that Africans suffered historically due to colonialism and due to so many problematic things that were directly entrenched on them by white colonizers who chose to take their land. And for proposition to stand in this debate and tell you that they do not need political rights was very abhorrent of them. There's a few things that I'm going to talk about in this speech. Firstly, I'm going to talk about strategy. Why proposition this is this debate on strategy alone, and then I'm going to go on to content and analyze the clashes that happened. I think first, you note that proposition's case actually gets majority of its building in third speech. They give you legitimate actual mechanisms for a model in third. That in itself is strategically unjust. But secondly, when we question their strategy, when they, their mechanizations in first speech, we told you that you cannot just claim that political will and genuine political incentives existed for this policy to be implemented in the way that they say it. They needed to mechanize and show you how that would actually happen. Throughout three speeches, they provided no mechanization of why these politicians would be held accountable, why they would redistribute the land in the way that they say they would, and all these other are just, just things that they claim. What this meant for their entire case is for all the benefits of individuals getting food, getting land, were contingent on them showing you that their model would ever be mechanized. Sharon questioned this in first speech and throughout three speeches, they failed to engage and show you what had happened. Second, we told you that when you redistribute land, it is oftentimes given to the leaders. And then those leaders of those countries now have a now have like some obligation to redistribute it to the rest of the society. We showed you how historically in colonized states that never happened. They kept this land, gave it to some of their direct people who bought into their parties, people who fought the wars, majority of the citizens who were on the ground never got land on redistributive mechanisms. We showed you why that would never happen. But mostly we told you that that's not how reparations works in their best case scenario. We told you that reparations are actually possible on our side. The reason why this was so is we explained to you that the moment people get political and civic rights, then they had a right to claim reparations and to claim land that they had historical ownership to. We showed you that this is something that they could attain through a judicial system. The only response you got to this was, you needed money to access the judicial system. We told you how newly built judicial systems were very accessible for these individuals, but further than that, they did not prove that they got the money that they say is necessary to access judicial systems. Anyway, so then are the comparatives on argumentations. I think firstly, it's on which side can have both. Note, we told you that proposition can never have both in this debate, because effectively countries that prioritize having economic redistributions in status quo are still actively in dictatorships that are primarily harmful countries like Zimbabwe, and it is very weird that they claim Rwanda under Paul Kagame, which is literally an autocracy as an example for their case. But most importantly, we told you that countries that in status quo have both are countries that historically prioritize making sure that they first build political rights. That is to say countries like South Africa, countries like Namibia, and countries such as Egypt that they also claim again, which was very weird because the countries that first set up democratic systems that could hold these politicians into account and make sure that they did the policies that they promised the citizens. Further than that, we told you that the best example for this debate was SA and Zimbabwe. We told you that these are countries that exist very close to each other in proximity on terms of like geography and all this. We told you that most of the benefits that they could incur were symmetric for these two countries. But the difference was in what policy they chose to use in making sure that they actually achieved their form of like um, of, of freedom and independence. We showed you then throughout analogies how Zimbabwe in status quo is significantly worse on a political spectrum, on an economic spectrum. We've shown 
only how South Africans have directly managed most of them to at least have access and claim them that they historically owned was their ancestors and they got it back. We showed you how they've managed to recall presidents. The only response they gave you to this was to the example and not the analysis itself and was merely to say South Africa is corrupt, corruption is bad. We don't think that that was a harmless exclusive because we showed you that this analysis was not based off of that just impact alone. But most importantly, their third speaker concedes that these institutions are unstable on their side. We say that concession in itself meant that they could never get the pragmatics that they claimed proud to oppose. Okay, thank you, Opposition Reply Speaker. The last welcome, Opposition Reply Speaker. Panel, I'm no expert on African history and don't know the full depths of every example, but I don't think this is what debating is about, and I think is this is why opposition loses this debate today. This isn't an example war. What we would have needed is strategic and mechanistic evaluation of why they get a democracy, but we never get land redistribution. The problem is that the comparative they set up from the very first speech is an unfair one. This isn't South Africa versus Zimbabwe, the literal only example where land redistribution has failed. This is a nuanced engagement that we would have needed from the opposition to win this debate. We win because we can engage with their best case and because we can engage with our worst case and still tell you why land redistribution wins you the case every single time. For opposition to have any benefit in this debate, they would have needed to prove why they get basic quality of life for people. Because what they want to claim is, well, I can get economic rights through political rights. But panel, I want you to remember that in my very first speech, I told you that I can never access political rights if I don't have a baseline survivability. I just can't care about going to vote if I don't have bread on the table for my family. You get this because of land redistribution panel uniquely that. Even if you buy that it doesn't work perfectly on our side of the house, I think we're more likely to give this to more people. They would only be able to access these political rights anyways. Proposition, opposition doesn't have any benefit in their very best case, even when they get political rights, if they don't explain you why they get economic ones. Then I want to talk about the comparative exclusivity, right? Because I think opposition can only buy, like win this debate if you truly buy that the kind of redistribution we'll get is inherently unfair and just goes to flames, right? But I think the problem is, panel, that you will have to compare this to opposition's democracy going badly, right? And I tell you this in first about deadlocks, having no action ability because like the leaders just don't care. You're just in clashes with the ethnic parties the whole time. And because people want redistribution, have an active incentive to overthrow a government that doesn't give them that, right? What we what they never engage with that, right? Because the problem here is, in the worst case, this just means another civil war. This just means a weak government that is overthrown again and again and again. This is their worst case. They never engage with that. We think that we win by that alone. Let's engage with our worst case then, right? Because what they tell you here as well, your principally inconsistent panel, we just don't care. We're better at the degree of fulfilling reparations. They never give you mechanism why they get, like we get enough, right? But in the second, they want to claim, well, this is inherently an unequal distribution. You only give this to loyalists. They ignore what Tahun and Ode talked to you for four minutes throughout both of their speeches, right? You will necessarily want to cater to everyone rather than creating a small elite, right? If I give Ode and Tahun all of my land, it's much more likely than they can that they can overthrow me, me rather than when I give it to all of you in this room, because individually, you're less likely to overthrow me. This is an incentive to do land redistribution well. I'm not going to give it to all of my, like only like the loyalists. Second, I think the leader is afraid of being overthrown again if they don't do this well. I think because people have such a massive desire, which they never contest, this is likely to be very, very, very well done, right? We see this in examples. We see this in Ghana, for example, right? I think other ethnic groups will then hold them in check. It's likely to be very well done. But even if that weren't true, they tell you, well, but like the government is too weak. Panel at best is asymmetric. If the government is so weak, they never get a democracy on ours, their side of the house as well. I think much rather it's then easier to get land redistribution because it's only one time because ethnic parties have an active incentive to buy into that and to get it well done. What is the impact of this panel? I think we're way more likely to get good land redistribution than they are to get good democracy. But I think even if they win on good democracy, you necessarily have to have economic rights before political rights, because you're never able to access a democracy without having the baseline survivability. Panel, I think opposition then only lastly wins if you really buy that these authoritarian leaders will be so brutal and kick their population down and stuff like that, right? I think these are extreme cases in which we get international accountability, similar to their side of the house. We have only ever seen this in Zimbabwe, even then we have gotten US backlash and clearly Mugabe isn't in power anymore. 
panel, opposition loses this debate because they fail to engage with the comparative in this debate. That's a bad democracy against bad land distribution. It's good land redistribution against good democracy. We win in either case, so proud to propose. Okay, thank you, other speakers.